Hi there, this is Heather Goodall, and in this module we're going to discuss electrolyte disturbances. The two objectives today are to identify two electrolyte disturbances observed in the male population and review possible treatment options for those electrolyte issues. So just bringing us back to basics again, renal physiology, remember that, what the kidney looks like, what's all included in here. So this picture is a good anatomy type description picture that reminds you about where things are located inside the kidney, what are some things that we talk about with concentration of sodium or potassium and fluid loss, those kinds of things. So what you see here <clears throat> is you can see where the renal artery and renal vein are connected right next to that um, ureter. And then as that ureter comes up to the kidney, expands into the renal pelvis and then goes into all the various areas of the kidney. Um, with the major calyx, the minor calyx, and then out into the medulla. So when you're looking at this, this is just a generic gross description of the kidney. The kidney begins to form actually around five weeks gestation. Renal development will appear to be under the control of growth factors, regulatory genes, and renal innervation. So it tends to be a little bit not as concrete of development as some of the other organs. Nephrogenesis is complete at 35 weeks gestation. So that's in the time when each kidney actually has 800,000 nephrons. So an infant born at 26 weeks won't complete nephrogenesis until nine weeks postnatal age. So there is still time for that kidney to have to develop in that time frame being in our unit before you actually see a full formed kidney or when it has at least that many nephrons available. As far as physiology, the absolute renal blood flow and the percentage of cardiac output directed to the kidneys increases with advancing gestational age. So as that baby gets older, more renal blood flow will get to the kidneys and a percentage of that cardiac output gets to be greater shunted to the kidneys. Prenatally, the kidneys receive only about 4 to 6 percent of cardiac output, so pretty small fraction. Then as that infant gets older, they will get more of it. Postnatally, the renal blood flow increases, reaching up to 10% of cardiac output by one week of life. So this is talking towards the full-term age infant. Adult values of 20 to 25% are reached at two years of age. So already by two years of age, we have this kidney that's pretty well developed and has most of its cardiac output blood flow happening. Glomerular filtration rate in the field kidney increases steadily with advancing gestational age as well. And so the GFR of a term infant is a third more than that of a 32 that should end 34 week gestation infant. So when you see this, this is um, that infant just in a couple of weeks has way more glomerular filtration rate. So when we're looking at our 23, 24 week gestation infant, obviously they are not going to have much of a glomerular filtration rate at all. And so as that infant gets older, that we should be able to see more of this happening. So let's practice this question. What test indicates glomerular filtration rate? A is BUN, B is creatinine, or C is specific gravity? So the correct answer is B, creatinine is actually the test that indicates glomerular filtration rate. The newborn has limited ability to concentrate urine, resulting in increased vulnerability to dehydration. So meaning that it doesn't really help to kind of store it up in the kidney and then get rid of it. It tends to just keep leaking it out, and so that makes it the infant more vulnerable to dehydration. The newborn is able to dilute urine in response to increased water load. The premature infant ability to dilute urine is limited because of the low GFR. So the premature infant isn't able to do what a newborn full term would be able to do. Excessive administration of water may place the newborn infant at high risk for dilutional hyponatremia and hypervolemia, which would make sense. If we give this infant way more fluid bolus than they need, then we're going to put them at higher risk for dropping their sodium levels, and now we've increased their fluid load circulating within their blood volume. So. Um, we have to be, you know, cognizant of making sure that we keep things in balance. 
Profoundly immature renal function often leads to water and electrolyte imbalance in premature infants. So because of their inability to dilute the urine, they aren't really able to, they don't have good glomerular filtration, they have reduced maximal, proximal, and distal tubule sodium reabsorption, and um, the decreased bicarbonate reabsorption and potassium and hydrogen ion secretion. So they just have definitely immature renal function when they're not full-term babies. So let's talk a little bit about insensible water loss because we do find that there are things that we probably need to be doing in the first couple of days of life to help to combat some of this issue. More than just thermal regulation, but also to look at what are the electrolytes doing and what are we doing within their first couple of days of enteral or parenteral nutrition. Insensible water losses are evaporative losses via the skin and respiratory tract. And some causes of insensible water loss include things like the radiant warmer, phototherapy, immature skin integrity, which unfortunately just comes along with how old they are, respiration, and NG drainage. So if they had a repogal in because of some kind of GI issue, or if the respiratory status is not very stable, then they're going to be breathing all of that out, so then they're going to lose water that way. Now as far as radiant warmers, um, when we're looking at this, this is why there's um, much encouragement to be using isolates. So if you have a giraffe that can be in a radiant warmer but then can close and be a giraffe or be an isolate, then that's what we should be doing to help to maintain good thermal, thermal regulation and to make sure that we're not causing any more issues with insensible water loss. So what causes increases in insensible water loss? Severe prematurity is probably the number one thing. So you can see it actually can go up to 300% of water loss just because of their age. An open warmer bed can be up to 100%. Phototherapy, anywhere from 30 to 50% of increased wa insensible water loss. Hyperthermia, meaning too hot, 30 to 50%. And tachypnea, 20 to 30%. So the more they breathe out, then that would definitely increase their water loss. What can decrease insensible water loss? Use of plastic wrap at delivery humidification in the incubator, so if we're using um, humidification within our isolates, having good policies in place for that. Um, so I am used to having humidification set at 85% for any infant less than 28 weeks, and we do that for the first week of life. Now if there is a lot of condensation happening within the isolate or rain out, then we would have to decrease the humidification by 5% just until we see that there isn't a lot of condensation. And then we maintain that for the first week of life. After that first week of life, we're going to drop it by 5% every 12 hours until we get to a minimum of 50%. That infant stays in 50% humidification until they are four weeks old. So they're in humidification for a long time, trying to help with making sure they don't have a lot of insensible water loss and don't have a lot of thermal regulation issues. Along with that plastic wrap, we should also be using that chemical thermal mattress because that will also help with decreasing this risk. Servo control is definitely something we should be uh, programming into our isolates. So that way the machine does the work, not the baby. And we're trying to make sure that our thermal regulation status stays within normal. Tracheal intubation with humidification. So of course, putting on humidification as soon as we're able to try to make sure that we do provide some of that replacement of the water that they're losing. So let's talk about fluid balance for a little bit. And when we're looking at fluid balance, those are some things to keep in mind. The birth weight, the decisional age, if there's phototherapy in use, if there's humidity that's been used in the isolate, the type of warmer, if they're on a warmer, and then what's the respiratory status. Fluid replacement has to be carefully calculated to allow for normal loss of extracellular fluid and weight while preventing dehydration from insensible water loss. Fluid and electrolyte replacement therapy should be monitored by daily weight measurements, vital signs, and the urine and serum lab studies. Now this is where we have to balance things out. If we have a newly born infant who is extremely premature, low birth weight, that we might have to be putting in a little bit of extra electrolytes just to help with replacement 
because of the insensible water loss that they go through. And we do know that infants at the first couple days of life lose weight anyway. That's just part of their um, transition to extra uterine life. And so when we're looking at that, it is good to remind ourselves that, okay, they're going to lose a little bit of weight, but we're going to be able to maintain once they stable up out. Um, there is um, some discussion about whether or not daily weights should be done on very low birth weight infants or preterm infants that are definitely unstable. And in my experience, we have gone to keeping the birth weight for the first week of life for infants that are less than 28 weeks and don't do any daily weights until they get to be seven days old. And the reason for that was because we knew that there was going to be some fluctuation within the cells because of just the natural transition to extra uterine life. And why put them through more stress of being weighed? Yes, we do have a scale in the isolate, which makes it really easy. But if they're really unstable with blood pressure and respiratory status, that maybe it would just be better to hold off and wait to do the daily weight. Do our dietitians like that? Maybe no, <laughs> but we're trying to do what's best for the patient. At birth, the percentage of body weight represented by water is actually closer to 75% in term infants and almost 90% in preterm infants. So a lot of their weight is actually water. The expected weight loss during the first three to five days of life is 10 to 15% of the birth weight in term infants. And during the first three to five days of life in a preterm infant, it is 15 to 20 percent. So we do allow for a little bit more in that preterm infant. So I want you guys to go ahead and get out your calculators. And for purposes of this course, sure, you can use your phone <laughs> to use your calculator. But I want you to figure this out. A 1,500 gram infant just born has this fluid order, D10W at 4 mLs per hour you know that this rate is what? A is too high, B is correct, or C is too low? So we'll let you take a little bit to answer this question. Okay, so let's walk through how you would calculate this question. I know that on the first day of life, fluid orders are 80 mLs per kilo per day. So start with that. So if I had a 1,500 gram infant and I needed 80 mLs per kilo, so I'm going to do the 1.5 because that would give me 1.5 kilos, so I converted it from grams. So 1.5 times 80, that would give me my total fluid volume. This is asking me though if I have an IV rate per hour they say four. Is that correct? So how do I figure it out per hour? Divide that number by 24. So 1.5 grams, so 1.5 times 80 divided by 24 will give you your hourly rate for your IV. So if you had done the calculation, you would find that the IV rate should be five. So five mLs per hour. So you would know then that this rate would be too low. So we would not be giving enough fluid to this baby. And possibly not enough glucose either. So when we're looking at this, um, these are very loose guidelines. And so you might see any variation of this in your practice. As far as the exam is concerned, what you would need to know is what are common IV rates ordered. And that would, excuse me, that would be the 80 mLs per kilo per day. So in a term baby, D10W at 80, C, 80 mLs per kilo per day. So that would be the starting IV rate. Preterm infants might do okay with D7.5 at the 80 mLs per kilo, we could probably go up to 100 if we felt like we still needed to give them a little bit extra. The infants less than 800 grams, probably around D5, and it might up their fluid intake 
to 120 if we felt like they really needed to have a little bit of extra fluid and maybe even a little bit of extra um, glucose within that. When we time we get to be day two to three, you're going to adjust the fluid intake based on the urine output and the weight. So this will dictate how well our kidneys are at least able to do some kind of function and what the weight is. Now, if we, like I just said, if you have a very low birth weight infant, you might not be doing daily weights, then you're probably going to be watching your urine output a little bit more closely then. Um, and that way you can kind of keep on, on top of any fluid shifts. If you don't check your urine output until after you've done your full 12 hours, that means that you're 12 hours behind whatever fluid balance is happening for your patient. So it might be a good thing to maybe check your urine outputs more often. If that's every time you do CARES, if that's you know halfway through the shift, whatever that is, but it probably is to, needs to be done more often than just once a shift when you have a brand new infant who is especially premature or very low birth weight. We'll talk a little bit about overhydration. Overhydration is considered when we have urine flow rates that are more than three cc's per kilo per hour and the specific gravity is less than 1.005. There's a loss of less than 2% body weight, so meaning they haven't really done that fluid shift like they would normally see after birth. And overhydration will increase the risk for PDA, BPD, IVH, and neck. And think about why that is. If I have extra fluid volume in the bloodstream, that means I have maybe a little bit more pressure within that system. And so why does it increase the risk for PDA? Is because then it would probably keep that PDA open because more of that blood flow will be trying to get through and it might stall that PDA being able to be closed. Now as far as causing bronchopulmonary dysplasia, we know that those lungs can get overloaded with fluid and so now we possibly have increased the risk of that. Same with IVH, remember we talked about the pressure passive system. If I have a lot of extra fluid in my circulatory system, that blood flow goes to the brain as well. And so now I possibly have caused issues there. And then as far as if it increases the risk for neck, it's because just the fluid overload within the tissues, not able to be absorbed, and then it causes some inflammation. And that inflammation would then predispose the gut for neck. Now, as far as underhydration, this is when we have a urine flow rate that's less than 1 ml per kilo per hour and a specific gravity that's more than 1015. Now, as far as when I'm giving you values for specific gravity, you might not do it at the bedside anymore, but you could still send a sample down to the lab to be done, and this would get reported. As far as the exam is concerned, you probably just need to know what are the outer limits of normal on specific gravity. If you just kind of know in ballpark, 1010 is kind of your normal, then that's the only number I would encourage you to remember. There's a loss of more than 20% body weight in underhydration, and this increases the risk for hypotension, acidosis, hypernatremia, hyperkalemia, and hypovolemia. And that would make sense. If I don't have enough fluid load, that, that means I'm going to have an increase in my sodium and I'm not going to have enough fluid volume circulating and that would contribute to my hypovolemia. It would also increase my levels of potassium. It can lead to hyperosmolarity, which may be a risk for IVH, and it's just because of that fluid just being that much more concentrated, and so then it would possibly cause that issues within that pressure passive system in the brain. Now we're going to go into electrolytes themselves. We'll talk a little bit more about okay, what each one does and um, what the normal lab value is. Now this is just per textbook, so even though maybe your lab reports tell you guys slightly different numbers, you want to go with what the textbook says for test purposes. So the normal lab value for sodium is 135 to 145 MEQs per liter. Sodium is the principal extracellular ion. It's essential to the maintenance of intracellular and extracellular integrity, so it helps with that cell wall inside and outside. Main contributor to intravascular and interstitial osmotic pressure. And an immature kidney has a low capacity to reabsorb sodium in the distal tubules. So meaning that it's not really able to hold on to it. 
if there is any issues with that sodium level. Hyponatremia is defined as a level less than 127. Some of the causes would be volume overload, inadequate sodium in the TPN, or for some reason they're not absorbing it with feeds. Increased sodium loss, drug-induced hyponatremia, and syndrome of inappropriate diuretic hormone. And again, that's kidney-related. So this is when you're going to have to be watching for what their sodium levels do. And if they do need a little bit of supplementation, possibly even um, a little bit of maintenance boluses or oral if they're able to do feeds. Symptoms of hyponatremia include seizure activity, usually with a sodium below 120, edema, decreased skin trigger, and dry mucous membranes. The treatment really depends on the cause, meaning that if we need to maybe watch out how much volume we're giving because it's too much, or we need to make sure and give some supplementation of sodium. Rapid corrections may cause brain damage, and so that's why you do have dosing that's kind of spread out over time to make sure that we don't cause any brain damage within that. Hypernatremia is considered to be sodiums more than 145. Some of the causes would be loss of water because of either insensible water loss or because the kidneys just, you know, can't hold on to it. Failure to adequately replace the water loss, and it could be iatrogenic as well. So just trying to get to increasing their free water and possibly restricting their sodium will help to bring this sodium level down. Some symptoms of hypernatremia include weight loss, possibly even increase in weight. So if you go either way, that's maybe a little bit more abnormal. And could be accompanied with tachycardia, hypotension, and metabolic acidosis. Chloride normal lab level is 9 to 5 to 105. And so you'll see that on your lab results. And that might also help you in looking at their acidotic states when you do blood gases. Um, the imbalance contributes to the acidosis. So that's why we talk about that with blood gases. Potassium, the normal lab value is 3.5 to 5. A mineral element, it serves as both the principal cation in intracellular fluid and it's an important electrolyte in extracellular fluid. So it tends to stay more in the, inside the cell. Participates in many functions, including metabolism, cell membrane homeostasis, nerve impulse conduction, and muscle contraction. And it is required for growth as a homeostatic function. So if we have low potassium levels, we might have an infant that doesn't grow very well if this isn't kept in place. Hyperkalemia, the definition of this is serum level greater than 6. Some causes could be because it's falsely elevated, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Excess potassium administration, tissue necrosis or destruction, decreased potassium clearance, hemolysis of red blood cells, some medications cause increase in sodium or serum potassium, um, metabolic respiratory acidosis, and decreased insulin levels. So if I have a falsely elevated potassium level, this could probably be due a lot to the way that we drew the lab. Now whether you have lab techs that draw your heel stick lab, um, lab tests, or if it's yourself that does it, be really careful about how you handle that heel, because the more you squeeze, the more hemolysis of the red blood cells happen, and the, the higher that potassium level is going to be, and it will be false. It's really tough sometimes to try to get labs from infants who are really tiny, um, or they've had their poor heel stuck a couple of times. And so maybe it might be better to do a venous draw. But when you're looking at where you poke the heel for this, for any lab value, definitely make sure that you're in that meteor side of the heel, not on the very back of the heel, because that's where that nerve comes down from the spinal cord, down the back of the leg, and down the foot and underneath. So try to make sure you avoid the very, very back of that heel. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about those kinds of things, issues long term down the line, but just be really good about trying to look at your um, technique. The other thing is, is that the longer it sits in a lab tube, the more it's going to 
elevate because then it just starts to um, degenerate while it's sitting in the tube. So unfortunately there are times if maybe the lab doesn't get the sample run very quickly that your serum potassium is going to be higher because it just sat in the tube. So keep those things in mind when you are seeing your lab results. Symptoms of hyperkalemia include things that are um, Brady or tacky type of heart rhythms, cardiovascular instability or collapse, and abnormal ECG patterns. They can even be asymptomatic, really, until you take a lab draw. Um, if there are ECG changes, you can try calcium gluconate, sodium bicarb. Um, you can give an extra little bit of glucose along with some insulin to kind of help combat how much the glucose will increase in the blood. Or you can try KXLate as well. If there are no ECG changes, you can stop administration of any potassium, start sodium polystyrene sulfonate, and monitor potassium levels if you needed to. Again, we don't really see this as much in our patients because it's usually because of a heel stick that, didn't, that was not great technique. Or it sat in the tube. If unable to lower the potassium level, you might need peritoneal dialysis or hemodialysis. Not all the units do dialysis, so if that's the case, they're probably going to have to transport this patient to somewhere else to get those done. So if we can troubleshoot what's going on with that sample, that might be better. Hypokalemia is defined as potassium less than 3.5. Some causes include, include inadequate maintenance infusion, meaning that there isn't enough potassium in the TPN. Some medications cause low potassium. GI tract losses, so if they're having some kind of issue with their GI system, where they have a repogol or they're having diarrhea, those kinds of things would cause GI tract loss. Hypercalcemia, hypomagnesemia, those all contribute to possible having hypokalemia. Renal tubular defects, so if our renal tubules aren't structured the way they're supposed to be, and then an increase in intracellular uptake. Some symptoms of hypokalemia would be ileuses, muscle weakness, decreased tendon reflexes, probably ECG changes you would see with arrhythmias. So how do we treat this? We're going to reduce the renal or GI losses, meaning we'll probably have to replace elements depending on how much loss is happening in those other systems. And then we can just increase that potassium gradually. Obviously, we're not going to be doing a full-on potassium bolus IV. Um, but you would want to see if you could increase it in the TPN that's being infused or maybe provide um, a little bit of a structured but stepwise approach to giving a little bit extra potassium. Calcium normal lab values are 7.6 to 10.4, which is the total calcium which you usually see on lab results. If it's ionized, 4.2 to 5.5 is your normal. Calcium is important for blood clotting, enzyme activation, acid-base balance, function of nerves and muscles, including the heart muscles. And so, heart muscle. And so, it's important to um, monitor our calcium levels so that we don't have any issues, especially with blood clotting and the heart muscle. It's also important in maintaining membrane permeability. Hypercalcemia serum levels are greater than 11. Some of the causes of this would be primary hyperparathyroidism, excessive supplemental calcium or vitamin D supplements. Sometimes, but not, you wouldn't see this very much, but congenital hypercalcemia as well. And remember what I said before with our sugar discussion. If you have low glucose levels and low calcium, we should probably be talking about Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome. Hypercalcemia, symptoms are poor feeding with poor weight gain, depre depressed tone, lethargy, polyuria, and shortening of that QT interval on our ECG readings. Treatment will depend on the cause, but the calcium intake should be reduced, so maybe reducing some of that element they get in TPN and we're going to hold back on our vitamin D. Remember that vitamin D and calcium work together in tandem, so if we cut back on our vitamin D supplements, then hopefully our calcium levels will drop. Hypocalcemia is defined as calcium levels less than 7, 
Some causes include early onset with interruption of maternal supply. So because of maybe not getting enough in gestation. Um, poor enteral intake, maternal diabetes, perinatal stress, alkalosis, blood transfusions, and diuretic therapies can all cause low calcium. Hypocalcemia symptoms are apnea, irritability, slight tremors of the extremities, profound tetany or seizures are obviously, that's the, the, one of the worst symptoms, cardiac dysfunction. And if it's a chronic issue, if you continue to have trouble trying to maintain calcium levels, they're possibly going to develop rickets and have long bone or rib fractures. So that would be a chronic condition that we could have contributed to if we didn't treat it appropri appropriately. So we want to make sure and watch that. The best treatment is administration of calcium. The thing about this is when I first started in NICU, remember that calcium gluconate we gave a lot, IV bolus. And I remember starting those infusions and being so nervous about this calcium gluconate infusion running. Because a lot of times it was in a peripheral IV, not necessarily a central line. And trying to monitor that IV site at that time frame when the calcium gluconate was infusing, it just really made me nervous. And I would actually go back and forth to the bedside multiple times, if I even left the bedside, waiting for that calcium gluconate infusion to be done. Because it just felt like there were times I've heard of colleagues where they'd start the infusion and come back five minutes later and their IV site is just completely um, swollen and it has phlebitis. And then we worry about necrosis and everything else. So calcium infusions are just really scary to me. The good thing now is that most of them are included within the TPN, so we don't have to worry about it as much. But we still want to keep track of what our IV sites look like, because um, even if we're using central lines with our TPN, we should be watching how that goes and what goes on with the tissues around it and that kind of thing, because calcium can still cause um, issues within the tissues. So let's try this practice question, and then we'll be done with this module. Renal function tests, including electrolyte levels, should be obtained before starting which medication? A is fentanyl, B ampicillin, C indomethacin. So it's C, indomethacin. Remember what indomethacin side effects are, possible kidney interaction with having low urine output. So making sure we check our renal function is going to be important before we start that medication. And that concludes this module.